Today's webinar titled, Follow the Leader, An Evolution in Leadership Spaces. Our presenter today is Lorraine Schunk, Strategic Account Manager for Steelcase, Inc., the global leader in the office furniture industry. Steelcase delivers a better work experience to its customers by providing products, services, and insight into the ways people work and learn. Its portfolio includes architecture, furniture, and technology products. Lorraine joined Steelcase in 2000 with a focus in the central New York market area. Shortly thereafter, she assumed responsibility for covering all of upstate New York from Albany to Buffalo. Lorraine has extensive experience in both corporate and higher education accounts. Lorraine has over 26 years of experience in the contact, excuse me, the contract office furniture industry. Prior to joining Steelcase, she was an account manager for A. Pomerantz and & Company and sales manager for Stevens Office Interiors. Lorraine resides in our hometown of Syracuse, New York, and we are thrilled to have her with us today. So Lorraine, let's begin. Great. Thank you so much, Amber, and thank you to Rochester Institute of Technology's Alumni and Development Office for inviting me to participate in your webinar series. I am excited about today's topic, as I believe it is of great interest, but even more so because it is one of the core areas we explore and research often at Steelcase. So let's get started into the meat. Since someone first hung a sign outside of their door, leaders have been inside shaping how work gets done. As the business climate changed over time, so did the ways leaders needed to lead their organizations. Today, traditional hierarchy-based management practices that may have guaranteed success in the past may no longer work, and that in turn requires a different approach to the workplace. From the Industrial Revolution to today's mobile and global economic climate, the place leaders go to get their work done looks very different. Steelcase has been at the forefront of this progression from the start. So let's take a look at the chronology of leadership spaces. And I decided to go back to the early 1900s, time of importance of industry, commerce, and agriculture. And no question that the personality of the leader became the leadership style for the company. So the role top executive desk was first designed with leaders in mind and focused on information security and efficiency. And for those of you participating on the webinar that even somewhat recognize this beautiful piece of antique furniture, it provided the efficiency by all of those small cubbies that they could store things in, that they were within reach in a very simple manner, as well as all of the file drawers. And the security was addressed by the fact that you could roll that roll top down and lock it so they felt secure when they left their area. But as organizations grew, so did the front office. Businesses transitioned from a craft economy to a capital economy, and we began to see new philosophies around organizational structure and leadership. Leaders' desks, which symbolized success and status, also allowed for a more efficient workflow. And as organizations grew, they began to specialize, and we observed a shift to creative work. Businesses were no longer just making things faster and cheaper. They were developing new things and the next big idea. Desks had to support this new creative process. So here we are in the mid-1900s, and we need to move from efficiency to effectiveness. And again, you've got to love these photos that I came up with. This is how it was, folks. And it was clearly denoted when you stepped into an executive's office. It was all about hierarchy. It was all about the gatekeeper, the administrative assistant outside before you entered into these very palatial-like offices, the amount of filing space, and the window views, so dominant, and in some cases still today, typically the large corner office. So Peter Drucker, considered by many the founder of the modern management, coined the term 
knowledge worker in 1959. During the coming decades, Drucker's philosophy spoke to leaders in an increasingly complex world. He identified a move from efficiency to effectiveness. In other words, there was no point to being incredibly efficient in manufacturing a product that was soon to be obsolete. So this put leaders on a path to foster creativity. So I picked an example, just roughly, and again, for those on the phone, think about the rotary phone for any of you that did that. So AT&T, Bell Labs developed a rotary phone, which was revolutionary at its time. But they became so efficient in manufacturing and delivering that product, did they have both feet on the brake or maybe one foot on the brake and one foot on the gas because time was changing, touch tone technology was coming out? So were they paying enough attention to the innovation and, what, and the demand that was happening in the market to move forward? So there's no point in being incredibly efficient if you're not paying attention to the future and the demand and the change in technology. So you've got to move to effectiveness. The work was no longer going to be done alone at one's desk. It had to be done cross-functionally and on multidisciplinary teams to be creative and innovative. While for the most part direction came from the top, by the 1970s and 1980s you would find departmental units working together to solve big problems. Leaders looked for ways to increase the speed of organizational change. Top-down structure was inhibiting the ability to change direction fast enough. Value and importance of the culture of an organization began to rise. If companies had the right culture, they had a better chance at being agile. And the leadership environment adjusted by adding more shared spaces. This view is just one wing of our Steelcase Global Business Center in Grand Rapids, Michigan. There are four floors east and west with a fifth floor at the center of the building. The fifth floor was the executive floor from 1983 to 1995. The offices were palatial in nature, each with large private conference rooms and private bathrooms. They were truly, quote unquote, at the top, not only on the organizational chart, but physical location as well. So what do you imagine the feelings of the employees were on floors one through four? It certainly could lead to such thoughts of distance, disconnect, and maybe even potentially fear from the fifth floor executives. So in the mid-1990s, Steelcase prototyped a new groundbreaking approach for creating leadership spaces. This was the brainchild of then CEO James P. Hackett to relocate himself along with all of his executive management team from the fifth floor to the third floor. In the new leadership community with this small model version shown here on the slide, leaders moved out of private offices and away from leadership silos. Space changed from owned offices and conference room assigned by status and rank to a variety of shared spaces designed to strengthen networks. The purpose was to strengthen social capital as people would see each other more informally over the course of the day. At the center of the leadership community was a large open cafe that served as the hub. Jim Hackett gave permission to his sales executive team to personalize their own space and design the layout to suit their way of working. We actually kept those fifth floor executive offices furnished for several years so we could demonstrate to clients the cultural shift that took place within Steelcase. As the phrase goes, seeing is believing, and being able to show what was to what is during this time frame was a huge asset for us. This particular design layout, often referred to as a Nautilus, 
or similar to how a conch shell is formed, was preferred by a few of the senior level executives in the leadership community. Mark Greiner, then Senior Vice President for our Workspace Futures Group, a team of cultural anthropologists and industrial psychologists who research and observe human behavior in the workplace, preferred this layout, and he was one of the first executives to have a standing height desk at that time. The thought behind this type of layout was to be open and visible at the point of entry, with that area being the widest. Then as you slowly come in further, you have a semi-private collaborative lounge area. And lastly, coming all the way in is now the smallest area and where focus work is done by the individual. For over 20 years, our Senior Vice President and Corporate General Counsel, Lizbeth O'Shaughnessy, has worked in this type of open setting and really feels it offers her everything she needs to optimize her performance. So we're ready for our first polling question, so be on the lookout on your computer to submit your answer. Curious to see how many people are working in something similar to this, or if you're not, would you like to? And where are you in the process? And maybe you haven't even thought of these things. That's, that's great too, because it's all about introspection and thinking about your organization, thinking about your own spaces and what you can achieve and how you work best based upon the type of work that you do. So we have a good amount of people not quite sure. I'm sure you probably need a lot more visuals. If we had all afternoon, I could probably show you more examples than you could shake a stick at, but Good to just get your thoughts moving forward in this type of avenue. So some of you, 31% say yes. I like that. So we're, we're moving in the right direction. This slide shows you the office of Jim Hackett, who was our CEO at the time. Jim, too, liked to stand at his desk from time to time, and while this office was located in a corner of the building, the glass panels and desk area was quite open and visible to the general floor. However, he also had this secluded lounge space behind the wall where he could have private conversations or perform focused work. Jim was a voracious reader and visionary, so he loved to have many publications at his fingertips, and that is why the shelving is so dominant in his office. What is not shown in this photo is the camera, or what was called the quote-unquote wormhole, to David Kelly's office in Palo Alto, California, then CEO of one of the nation's leading industrial design firms, IDEO. Jim and David had a always-on understanding as they were collaborating on many initiatives together, and this allowed them to talk at a moment's notice live. Jim Hackett retired from Steelcase in 2013 at the age of 58, and since has been the interim athletic director at the University of Michigan, where he had played football for Bo Schembechler. He was also leading the Ford Motor Company's Car of the Future team when the Ford Board of Directors named Jim as President and CEO just last May. Leadership and vision, together with passion, can take leaders in directions sometimes they might never imagine. So we're getting ready for polling question number two. So how about this inspiring layout of the Woolworth building? A U-shape of offices dominated by hard walls, all with a beautiful view to the outdoors, the offices on the left side of the U, much larger than the others. And then as you come in, another step down in status. And then as you go out towards the top, why the offices get a little smaller. 
But interestingly enough, even those offices on the inside of the U still have glass and visibility to the outdoors. So I'm not here to say there is a wrong or a right. It has to properly fit and support you as a leader in your organization's culture. Row after row of hard-walled private offices may be the optimal solution for certain functions. However, it could also be a tremendous barrier to agility and growth. I must say, in 27 years in this industry, I have been in and out of many corporate facilities. And I have seen everything from something that resembles this type of layout to something very different and open and alive. But I'm, what I want to point out is that I did visit, on occasion, a large Fortune 500 company that is internationally based. And the executive management has offices that range somewhere between four and 500 square feet. If they're on international assignment and they're gone for several weeks or even several months, that office, that square footage sits there. It's an asset. It's costing the company money. Is that the best use for that asset? But it is the organization's culture that that office stay so when the executive returns, the office is there. I just bring that up to get you to think about real estate, your assets in your organization, and in particular, your space as a leader. So I have a brief two-minute video of Sarah Armbruster our Steelcase Vice President for Strategy, Research, and New Business and Innovation. Sarah, in this video, is speaking at the Drucker Forum in 2016, where the topic was, Time to Change the Practice of Management. Let's take a listen how she begins to shape the audience's thinking on leadership and leadership spaces. space plays a role in enabling leaders to lead in the way Tim was just talking about, and why it's time for our spaces to shift from symbols of leadership as being about prestige and status to spaces that enable leaders to be present in their business in new ways. But before I do that, I just want to ask you for one second to close your eyes and think for a minute about Sydney, Australia. Just think. Think about what comes to mind. And I'm willing to bet that for many of you, when I asked you to think of Sydney, what came to mind was an image in your mind's eye of the Sydney Opera House. And if I'd asked you to think about Paris, you might have envisioned the Eiffel Tower. Or if I'd asked you about San Francisco, you might have thought about the Golden Gate Bridge. So why? I think it's because these structures are iconic. These are places that have become enduring in our minds and they have given their cities an identity. So think for a minute about your identity and think about how your place, your office, actually shapes your identity as a leader. How does your office help enable you to lead in the kinds of ways Tim was just describing? And does it support your being present in your business in the right ways? You know, it's interesting to reflect on the fact that there is much conversation about how offices in general are changing. And that's why we don't see many more spaces like this one. We all worry about how we can evolve the spaces that our employees use to help them be more engaged, to be more productive, how we can support their well-being. But there's not nearly as much dialogue about how the leader's own space might need to evolve. And I believe that as the practice of leadership shifts, our leadership spaces have to change as well, from spaces that symbolize prestige to spaces that enable presence. I believe that your office can make you a better leader.
So I think Sarah's summation there is really great, and I love that video to really get you thinking about your space, your personal space, your company's space, and what does it say about your organization and about you as a leader? Because today, business is changing. And today, business must be agile, it must be innovative, and it must be growth-oriented. At Steelcase, we are tightly focused on these three attributes at Steelcase. We are agile in the expansion of our product portfolio, both within our brand and across brands, by establishing new partnerships with the likes of Floss Lighting from Italy, well-known designers Mitchell Gold plus Bob Williams, and Blue Dot. So it's expanding the ancillary portfolio above and beyond and getting into this blend of residential and commercial all together. We are also laser focused on innovation, as we had our first live product reveal just yesterday for our brand new chair called Silk. Simple in design and operation, innovative in its materiality using carbon fiber. There are no supports, the only adjustment on this chair is seat height. You are entirely supported by the materiality of this chair. Truly revolutionary and very innovative in its artistry and its performance. Lastly, we are very focused on growth as well, with a recent announcement of our acquisition of AMQ Solution, a company that delivers quality products in very fast time at a value price point. So how about this space? Are any of you working in a space like this right now? Is it inspiring? Would you like to work here? I always say you can't see what you can't hear. Amber's with me today. If I was working in one cube and she was in the next, I can't see her. So what is my voice level? What's my inflection going to be? I'm probably going to be loud, kind of like I am right now, because I don't know if she's there. But maybe if the panels were lower, maybe if the environment was more open and more visible and I could see Chris who's next to me right now or Amber across the table, I would adjust my voice down and it would be more appropriate. And it would be great to know that Amber and Chris are in the office. And how about this? While the desktop computers in this photo are outdated, you might think this bullpen design is advanced and would be a great place for leaders to be. I give this credit over the slide I just showed you because yes, you do have great visibility and it does create a team atmosphere, but I still even think it can be improved upon. So as business changes, leadership changes. And today leaders must build connections within and across their organization rather than leveraging hierarchy to get things done. They must roll up their sleeves in collaboration creatively in a hands-on fashion to generate ideas rather than telling or directing and providing answers. And they must offer transparency to employees into strategy, work and process instead of leading behind closed doors. Ironically, the most often overlooked tool is the leader office. I can't emphasize this enough. I know that the biggest cost to any organization is its people, following close behind technology, process, and products. But what about that real estate? I'm going to keep coming back to that. And I'm going to keep talking about the power of the office and using it as a management tool. Anybody care to dance? I mean, really, take a look at this office. I think you could hold a high school dance in here with room to spare. Again, don't get me wrong, there may still be instances where something like this is appropriate, but I would certainly say it should be in the vast minority. Do you have one of these rooms at your office? Do you like attending meetings there? Are the meetings productive? And if they're not, why do you think that is? 
Again, I put these slides in to be thought provoking, to really get at the core of the type of business that you're in and how to help increase your effectiveness in your organization and make it fun and engaging for your employees. And what are the feelings you get when looking at this office? Is it inviting? <clears throat> Is it collaborative? What's going on behind that wall? Don't you want to go down that right or left hallway? I know I do. Who's down there? What's going on? So really, what is the point of this particular office setting? In 2016, Steelcase released a global engagement report. And while employee engagement is one of the top issues keeping CEOs up at night, they still are keeping their private office structure. So would employee engagement change for the better if the leadership spaces changed to something more visible? So your office can be a powerful, positive leadership tool. So here comes the third polling question, and I'm extremely curious to know if any of you have ever thought of your workspace as a company asset. The leaders are changing and they're using new tools. This is just a different way of thinking about your office and how it could shape the culture of your organization and giving them opportunity to even think about it and what, what kind of changes might it be? Would you keep the current physical location? Maybe you might change that. Does it still need to be behind walls? Could it be more open, but maybe shaped with spaces nearby that could support your needs for a private conversation or focus work? So these are all the types of things that we like to talk to clients about and really getting them to dive deep into really taking an introspective look into their spaces. This is great. So, so far we have a great majority of you that have thought of your workspace as a company asset. So you are ahead of the game. So I just encourage you to continue to take that one step further and go farther, go deeper into your organization and think about how you can continue to improve and make it even more powerful than what you thought so far. So why does physical space matter as a leadership tool? All right, everyone, this is the golden nugget about to be revealed for this presentation. And I always appreciate when the speaker tells me, if you remember nothing else, you should remember this. So here we go. Your space is the body language of your organization. It communicates your beliefs on your leadership, your culture, your goals, and your company's goals. Your space amplifies your behavior as a leader. So I'm gonna repeat that one more time. Your space is the body language of your organization. It communicates your beliefs on your leadership, your culture, your goals, and your company's goals. Your space amplifies your behavior as a leader. So in 2016, 2016, Steelcase researchers and designers began working on the next evolution of leadership spaces. The new leadership environment is an iconic symbol of the cultural change happening in leadership today. This new space relocated the entire management team from the third floor of the Global Business Center 
to the first floor of the building next door that connects our learning center to our new innovation center. Unlike the previous leadership community, which truly was a destination, this new space is on the traffic path of the company, making senior leadership more accessible and more visible while still able to access private areas when needed. I can tell you from personal experience when I'm hosting a client to Grand Rapids and I'm taking them through this space, it is not uncommon to see James Ludwig, our Vice President of Global Design, Jim Keen, our CEO, they are out and open. Their offices are out in the open and they have some private spaces along the wall to go. But this is definitely in its constant, constant traffic right down that center pathway where you see that gentleman walking with his um, bag over his shoulder. So this is a dramatic shift for us at Steelcase and the invitation to the rest of the organization is clear. Anyone can work anywhere, no matter what their title or status may be. So this shift from the isolation of the fifth floor, then to the destination of the third floor, has now transcended to this first floor. And this represents two major changes for Steelcase leadership in a span of just 20 years. And you may say, Oh, so that's one change every decade. Okay, maybe it's not so rapid. Maybe you'd think we're always prototyping. We study this because this is our job. This is our culture. This is what we do for a living. We're always prototyping and trying new things. But when you're doing it on a large scale like this, this is a dramatic shift. So think of your own organization. How often have you assessed your leadership spaces and the way you're working to make any dramatic changes. So our fourth polling question is on its way, and I'll be interested to see the results. And maybe this is a little bit difficult to measure, so have you had the opportunity to leverage your workspace to deliver enhanced company results? And so we have a yes and no and a not sure. And for any of you that say yes, my hat's off to you, that's great. You're ahead of the curve and for those no or not sure, again, I'm just bringing it up to bring it to your attention, to think about it. And the, it has been proven that space together with culture and delivering on employee engagement is critically important to those needs that leaders are following in those three areas of agility, innovation, and being growth oriented. So we're about 50-50 for those of you that have responded. So that's pretty good. So we're gonna move into three design aspects that should help you think about your spaces for design with leadership and for your employees. So the first one is around designing for spontaneous interaction. And this slide is actually shown from our Toronto showroom in downtown Toronto. And it is a beautiful space. We're about 20 floors high with a look out to the lake. But just take a look at this particular setting. We have multiple postures. We, in the center where the purple chairs are, it's more of a nomad area. Again, people touching down, working independently, but maybe they do know the person across from them and might strike up a conversation. And in the forefront here, we have two people in a lounge type setting with the ability to have tools available close by for writing, which is important. And just again, access to daylight and views also helps to create that spontaneous interaction. So think about moving your office location to a more centralized area. Be at the hub of your organization. 
create open spaces for collaboration and chance meetings near your leadership spaces. Next, design for creative collaboration. This is critically important, and integrating technology is paramount. And it must be both analog and digital for content sharing and generation. And yes, I know we're in 2018 right now, but I cannot emphasize enough the power of analog communication. Have whiteboards available. Have flip charts available so people can sketch, draw, talk to what is going on in their brain. Because sometimes, and I know myself as a learner, I liked to write a lot of notes. That was my way of memorizing the way my brain works, is from the brain to the hand. Sometimes in this wonderful world of technology, being able to transfer that type of learning from your brain to technology, it's not as seamless, it's not as easy. So being able to pair the two together from both a digital perspective and analog perspective is extremely important. The next piece of this is to democratize interaction at all levels within the organization, to feel comfortable, pay particular attention to posture, height, and sight lines. Is there the opportunity for two people to sit eye to eye with each other or to stand shoulder to shoulder as equals? So even in this slide alone, if you look, these are standing height tables. Some people are seated, some people are standing, and they're at the same height. It provides equality. Where if you were, we went back to the slide I showed earlier of that conference table where everybody's sitting, one person is standing, one person, the person standing, owns that meeting. It's all about equality and providing postures so that everybody can feel a part of the meeting and contribute. So again, posture, heights, and sight lines are critical to the spaces for creative collaboration. And lastly on this particular slide, be sure to engage remote participants, just like what we're doing today. I don't know how far the widest person is, if you're in another country or another state, but thank you for joining us. And this is the same piece. You've got to use technology to foster remote collaboration and to connect distributed teams and leaders. So those of you RIT alumni, I praise you for staying connected to your alma mater. And no matter where you're located, you should be proud of it. It's a wonderful institution. So keep that in mind, to always keep those remote locations and those remote people connected to the main organization. And the third, design for transparency. So in this slide, you actually get a better view of that connective corridor between our innovation center and our learning center. So towards the back, where the colors are real prevalent, that's the administrative staff for our CEO, our CIO, our design director, our HR director, and Lizbeth O'Shaughnessy, our general corporate counsel, who I mentioned earlier in the presentation. She's actually up on that um, catwalk, if you will, up above uh, in the back. So she is a little secluded, but yet again, uh, very open in that uh, Nautilus design. And then all of the glass spaces on the left are various settings for uh, soft lounge settings for casual conversations for anywhere from two to four or five people. Uh, some have desks, so if our CEO needs to go in and have a conversation or do focus work, uh, he's likely in there. But again, think about it. You can see him in there. It's glass. It's not like what I showed you before, the 70s and 80s, where when the doors were closed, you had no idea. So it's very, very different. You can see people working in these settings. So again, 5, 10, 20 years ago, this was unheard of. Be it at Steelcase or any organization, I could walk in tomorrow and I could sit amongst our highest leaders in our organization and be working. So when you think about designing for transparency, 
Be sure to adopt a design with a range of views into and across spaces. Having daylight is paramount to that employee engagement and just feeling good and having the access to that natural daylight. So expose as much of that as you possibly can. And as I've talked about, be sure to have a balance of private spaces offering solutions for privacy, focused work, and actually a bit of respite. So our final polling question is arriving. And for those participating in the webinar today, in a leadership role, have you made any changes to your space or location within the last one to three years? And I'm going to be really curious to see how this comes through. Oh boy, the yeses are coming through nice. This is great to see. I love it. I was telling Amber and Chris here today, I, this is all new being on a webinar. I really prefer the live audience so I could see you and engage with you and ask you more and more questions about well, what did you do and is it working? And that's one thing that I definitely recommend. Make sure you're doing measurement. Know if it's working. And if not, what pieces are and what pieces aren't? And how, what about your employee engagement? Have the changes you've made really affected and increased employee engagement? And are you recruiting? Is it helping you think about your space as a recruiting tool? I haven't even really touched on that. That could be a whole other webinar. So, you know, I, I talked about the real estate. I talked about your leadership space as an asset. It amplifies who you are. It's totally who you are and your culture and your organization. So that's just, it's great to see so many of you that have already made some changes to your space or location. So in summary, your space can help you move from hierarchy to connectedness, from giving directives to engaging your organization, to being in a private refuge, to being in total transparency, and from one of prestige to enabling your presence in a new way. So at this time, I'd be happy to field any sure. questions yeah, no. that you might have. First, thank you, Lorraine. Um, that was fantastic, and I think we are going to take you up on your offer to continue your, your series because um, this was fascinating. We do have a few questions that came in, so thank you all for sending those our way. So I'm going to start with one. You mentioned the idle office problem, so this is a question from Michael. Um, you know, about the executive running off and is away for a few weeks, but that square footage just lays dormant. So how would you address this inefficiency? Well, I would say um, depending upon, um, well, two, I would take it down two paths. So the first path would be, does it have to stay in this manner? Um, think about the status and the culture of the organization. Because if the, if the culture and the status cannot be changed, then it will have to remain as is. And that status and culture change must come from the leader. So that, that is critical. If the leader is willing to make changes or adjustments and says, hey, when I'm out of the country or I'm going to be gone for several weeks or several months, I do want my office to be used, and I want it to be used in this way. I want it to be given to XYZ project team. I want it to be used as a, an extra conference room setting. Um, there are ways to gradually introduce that culture change to get that idle office away from being an expensive piece of real estate. The best way in going full uh, in one direction would be for that leader to say, I'm going to give up that office. I'm going to go to a much smaller space because I'm really only here 20% of my time, and this is totally inefficient. It's a waste of company dollars. So those are actually, I think I gave you three ways to think Perfect. about it. 
uh, three for the price of one. So you also mentioned within the office the, you know, welcoming in the virtual collaborators. But um, one of our participants, John, I think on the other end um, is wondering, this is kind of a two-parter, um, how, does, how does your presentation, what you have laid out here, apply to home environments with video conferencing as the primary mode of collaboration? And then he also asked, are virtual backgrounds on video calls a good idea for improving collaboration? All right, so I'll address the home office uh, first, and um, my home office primarily is on four wheels, uh, <laughs> number one. So I live out of my car, and um, but I do, when I do get home, um, I do have a home office. And I'm going to say that as unique as every individual is, I believe that they understand how best they work at home, and many of us do. We may leave a physical location at 5, 6, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night, whatever it is. You go home, and it's this culture of always on. So when you get home, where is your always on? After dinner, after you get the kids to bed, um, is it your couch? Is it, do you have a separate room? Myself, I, I have a separate room and it is upstairs and it's away from anything else because I do need that concentration. But there are people out there that like to be um, in the living room and they like to have their family members nearby. They can still concentrate. I don't know how they do that, but so um, that's kind of my take on the home office side. Um, on the remote virtual, I would say anything you can do to enhance the experience I am all for it. So if there are visual imagery um, to be behind you that, that helps either visually see the participants better or it uh, better replicates the setting that you're trying to achieve, um, I definitely would believe that that's a good direction to pursue. Great. And then um, John also had a question about the, I believe for Jim, when you're discussing Jim Hackett's office, in the forefront there was um, a small booth mm -hmm. there, and he was wondering what was the purpose of that table booth. All right. So that particular area is the area that was surrounded by glass panels that when he stood, there was actually a height adjustable desk and then a stationary work surface off to his right. So when he was actually working on his computer or his laptop, he was standing or sitting there and he was completely visible to the open floor. So it was very different at that time. You knew if he was standing there that he was in. The only time you didn't know whether he was in or not if he was around the corner behind that wall okay, where that, that at the seated okay. lounge area. Yes. Right. Um, Karen asks, with the line between the work-life balance becoming more blurred, how do you balance an open collaborative environment with an employee's expectations of some privacy? That is a great question, Karen. I love it. And boy, if we could all solve for this, why I think maybe everyone could, could retire. But yeah, <laughs> totally understand your question. We hear about it every day. It's probably one of the most challenging issues um, in the world of work today and in our industry. And you are totally right, the, the blur between uh, work and uh, personal life is, is more blurry. We're actually kind of coining a, a phrase, and I think I'm sure it's been around, but uh, something like resumercial. So it's, this, you know, between residential and commercial. So you hear about this resumercial life. Um, I always, and I, at Steelcase, we firmly believe and we dig deep, and that's why we have the researchers on our staff who know nothing about furniture. They're there to study people and human behaviors and how, what people need today to work and learn and what are, what are the trends. And then out of that research comes the development of the products to help enhance today's uh, work environment. Um, a lot of what we've developed recently is in support of just what you're asking. So, and again, back to leadership, the 
culture of the organization, the leadership of the organization, that's set from the top. And the expectations of the employees must follow that lead. So uh, we, we often talk about office protocols. You know, can you eat lunch at your desk or not? Is there a, a definite place for lunch? Can you take a personal phone call at your desk or not? Or, so if, when you set these protocols, you have to be able to have supporting spaces for your people to go for the lunch, for a conversation, for a private conversation. So I think if we can support spaces enough, and we believe strongly in a range of spaces, that it can be a very successful environment. Great. And then Stacy asks, what steps do you recommend a company take to make sure changes they plan to make in their workspaces match their culture? Well, um, Stacy, I would definitely um, recommend that um, you get employees in, involved. Um, the leadership has to be on the same page um, in thinking about, about the space. And you have to think about your work process. Um, I'm not sure what kind of business uh, that you're in, um, but that definitely drives um, what the space needs are and what it might look like. And, um, and also for the different environments. So that's, that's really uh, a lot of, of where we're at. Um, certainly, I'm going to do a self-plug promotion um, here. All of our steel case, um, all of my field counterparts around North America and around the US, if you engaged with one of them on your local behalf or reached out to your local steel case dealer, they will be able to help you, guide you uh, through uh, the various uh, options, and we do that really through asking an awful lot of questions and gaining insight into your into your organization, so that we can make some suggestions, and you will get a sense if that is really in support of your company's goals. So I hope that's not too long-winded answer to your question. Well, and then maybe one one question too that. Kind of piggyback on that. So let's say you know you're working in some of those cube environments that the pictures that you showed earlier in your presentation. What's one thing that you know maybe an employee that's not on the leadership level could do to enhance their own personal cube environment to um, make a more conducive and collaborative work environment with their fellow colleagues? Hmm. That's a good question, Amber. Can't um, jars? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking here, and I, I, I looked at that, you know, the one photo that I included where the panels are at least 65, maybe 70 inches high, and mm -hmm. okay, yeah, we got the Dilbertville or the Cube Farm. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I might suggest bringing a saw in and um, <laughs> cutting a hole in a panel between you and your neighbor. Um, that could be something because again. You don't know what you can't see, and um, I'm not quite sure how you could take an environment that's so visually creating barriers um, to to improve that. It, sure. It, it, it's hard. Sure. It's hard to do that. All right. Well, again, thank you, Lorraine. Um, this has been great, and we have you know a lot of questions from folks. So if if we didn't answer your question or you have additional questions um, for Lorraine, um, all your questions can be emailed to us at ritalum at ritedu or tweeted to at rit underscore alumni with the hashtag me rit webinars and we will direct your questions uh, to Lorraine. Uh, note that all participants will receive an email from us in the next few days with a link to today's webinar recording. And Lorraine, thank you so much again for being our presenter today, and thank you to all of our listeners for participating. Please consider joining us next Tuesday, February 13th, 
not next Tuesday, but a couple Tuesdays from now, excuse me, for Panic, Sweat, and Cheers, A Toastmasters Journey with Stephanie Griffin. In this webinar, you will learn more about what Toastmasters is, what to expect at a Toastmasters meeting, how belonging to Toastmasters helps grow your communication and leadership skills, and what small things you can do today to become a more confident public speaker. In her talk, Stephanie will also share her personal stories on her journey as a Toastmaster. Look for your special invitation in your email shortly. Again, thanks for joining us. Please exit this webinar by simply closing your WebEx windows. And please do let us know what you thought of the webinar by taking the very brief survey, which will pop up when you exit. Have a great day, and we hope to see you in another one shortly. Bye.